invented carefree cooking? Was it me, Chef Todd? Or did I just copy something that had been going on for hundreds of years on this little tiny island I'm on right now? The birthplace of carefree cooking today on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cooks Code. Boom! Welcome back to the Carefree Cooks Code, everyone. It's Chef Todd. I look like I'm stranded on a desert island, and I almost am. We're live every Tuesday at noon Eastern, don't forget, but... I have to admit, this week, we're not live. I am not live right now. Now, normally, you would go to webcookingclasses.com slash live and register for my alert system so that you would know when my hat was crooked, uh, then you would know when we were going live. But today, I had to make this video for us just a few hours ago uh, because I'm on a really small island right now in the middle of the ocean, and every time that I try and use the coconut telegraph, on one of these little tiny islands somewhere. It never works out. My travels never work out. So I've put this watch party together so we can all discover something new from what I'm about to share with you today and not suffer from any technical issues. But to remind you why we're here to get today, because we're the Carefree Cooks. We create our own recipes. We bring our friends and our family together because of this. We learn every time we cook. It's important. We define our own cooking styles. Uh, we uh, 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 practice pro methods. That's what I was thinking. And we love our cooking. So, look, uh, we're not live today. Like I said, I'm recording this because I've tried to do this from different islands and different locations, and it, it's terrible. It, you know, I stutter. Uh, <laughs> and stick and things like that uh, because we don't want to do that, okay? Oh, I've got a what am I for you this week. There it is. What am I holding? What is that weird-looking thing that I found just the, down the street from here a few years ago down the street from here? But what is that? It's a... I can't give you any clues. Uh, tell me in the comments below the what am I today if you recognize what that thing is. Yeah, you know, I do that uh, Carefree Cooks Creed every week, and we are the Carefree Cooks. But did you ever stop and wonder where this whole idea ever came from? It, it, you don't really get a carefree cooking attitude from the food TV. You don't really get it from cookbooks, right? These are very hard and fast rules. There's nothing about it that's really carefree. They really always seem to make it hard, in my opinion. They make it very confusing, and a lot of times they make it really intimidating. Well, long before I was invited to go back to my alma mater, uh, before I went back to Baltimore International Culinary College, when I was an executive chef, and the general manager, too, of a business dining cafeteria in Raleigh, North Carolina, I was told what to do by the company that I worked for. I was told what to buy. I was told what I could cook. I was told how to cook it, and I was told how much to cook. So I didn't see this job as much as executive chef as I did robot chef. That's kind of the way I felt. It was the direct opposite of anything being carefree, which hadn't really been invented yet, I think, well, actually, I never invented it. Somebody else did. That's the point today. Somebody else invented carefree cooking, and they invented it in the first century. <laughs> and I only shared it with you once I found out about it in the year 2000, almost 20 years ago, but that's still a thousand years too late for you, right? Sorry I waited so long. So how come you never heard of carefree cooking before I started talking about it on the Internet, if it's been around for a thousand years. Why? Why was this concept such a well-kept secret for so long? And it's because of where this concept comes from. It's where 
I'm sitting right now. This is where it comes from, on this little, tiny, small island that me and my character are enjoying today. Because when you think about cooking and culture, there really aren't too many carefree cooking cultures around the world. And when I did finally return to the classroom at Baltimore Culinary College and I started teaching, one of the very first class, not one of the very first class they assigned me was a class called International Cuisines and Cultures. I was literally handed the textbook by the dean and told that the class starts in two days. Here, here's the textbook. <laughs> Have a good time on Monday. I had to learn everything about every culture in a weekend. Most people would be scared. I found it fascinating. I couldn't wait to jump in because culture and cuisine are bound together so tightly. And, and the more I researched, the more I found what changed food preferences, what, what made different people different all over the world, I came down to really just three things. There are really three things that separate cuisine and culture across the globe. And the first is the geography, what you can grow or what you can raise, right? The second is the religion. Religion, you wouldn't believe the religion has such a big impact on what and when you are told or can eat. But most importantly, it has to do with the history. You cannot unwind the, the cuisine and culture of a country without knowing who they conquered and took the ideas from, and then who conquered them and instituted their ideas in. This is how it all happens. And to me, it, it's, just, it's obvious that if you live by the beach, you probably eat a lot of seafood, right? If you raise goats in high elevations, because that's the only animal that would live there, well, then you probably eat a lot of goat meat. And if you consider a cow holy, well, that's your religion. You don't eat beef. So I started in my research for this international cuisines class, I started to notice a pattern developing as I was writing my lesson plans. So like I do Germany. Germany has sausages, fermented cabbages in a very traditional way. And that's really not very carefree when, when it's so traditional, right? We studied Spain. The rain in Spain falls mainly on the plain and the steppes of Spain are, are the most fertile area of the country, but their traditions also are so solid, they don't change much. I didn't really consider that carefree. China, when, when we did Chinese cuisine, thousands of years of history for a culture and a cuisine that, that really hasn't changed much in thousands of years, that's not carefree. And then, of course, we study French cuisine, sacre bleu. I mean, if there's a cuisine on the planet that's not carefree, it's the French. I have worked for a lot of snotty French chefs who insist, oh, it must be done. This is exactly where it is. Merde. They are inflexible. And French chefs are the least carefree people in the world, in my opinion. But look, when I came across this chapter on this island that I'm sitting on right now, it's the one that I've been visiting since 2000. It's the one that I realized, having gone through all these different countries, it's the one that I realized was the one that invented carefree cooking. And I'm in Hawaii. And the Hawaiians are the worldwide masters of carefree cooking. Because to me, carefree cooking is accepting ideas from other people, other cultures, uh, incorporating them, the good ideas, into your own repertoire and get rid of what are the ones that you don't like, right? The same way in that international cuisines class. Who did they conquer and take their ideas? Who conquered them and left their ideas? But there wasn't really any conquering going on in Hawaii. So when you give and take in kindness, it's good mana, as the Hawaiians say, because when you give, you receive. And when you accept... You complement the giver. That's what the Hawaiians believe. And it's a good thing, too, because nothing is native to Hawaii if you go far back enough. Right? I know a native Hawaiian, because there are native Hawaiians, they would argue with me. But at one time, Hawaii was a steaming pile of cooling lava in the middle of the Pacific. Right? There were no indigenous nothing living on lava. Nothing grows on lava. Nothing survives on lava. Okay? This 
is the youngest land on the globe. And this land is still growing. And the first few seeds that did grow, it's assumed that they floated over on the sea. Or they were carried in the digestive tracts of birds along with that fertilizer. Perhaps the first animals swam here. And the people that came from Polynesia in primitive canoes across hundreds of miles of open ocean, they brought nothing with them but their desire for freedom and a new culture. And if you want to read a really tremendous book about the history of the Hawaiian Islands, get James Michener's Hawaii. It's, it's an amazing read, but I'm not here for book reviews. The more I have visited Maui, Kauai, Oahu, Molokai, Hawaii, the Big Island, and the more that I read about the history and study the culture and, of the cuisine, the more that I realize that it was the Hawaiians that invented carefree cooking, and I stole it from them. It's just, it's just another theft by a Howley from the Hawaiians that's been going on forever. But since Hawaiian, Hawaii is the most remote place on Earth, and nothing is original native to these islands, well, that means everything was brought here by someone else. Everybody came here from somewhere else. Samoans and New Zealanders, Japanese, Chinese, Filipinos, Tahitians, uh, Koreans, Puerto Ricans, Portuguese, and Pacific Islanders of every culture found their way here, or they were brought here as laborers. And look, I could cover the next 1,500 years of Hawaiian history for you, but let's skip ahead uh, about a century and a half, because it is a very violent and very victimized history for the people. In the early days of the sugar plantations, around 1850, an estimated 340,000 workers were brought to the island. And 100 years later, by 1959, at the height of the sugarcane production, one in 12 residents in Hawaii worked in the sugar fields. And the story goes that when they would break for lunch, the Japanese workers would bring their teriyaki, teriyaki beef and rice with pickled vegetables. But seated right next to them might be their Filipino neighbors, and they had their traditional adobo dish or a pork or chicken type stew. Koreans sat down at lunch break. They had their kilby, their marinated ribs. The Chinese often had rice noodles or chow fun uh, vegetable dish. Hawaiians were known for their Kalua pig that they roasted in an underground emu. And it wasn't long before people began to share. They started sharing their lunches with one another, and the Hawaiian mixed plate was born. Today, the Hawaiian mixed plate is the personification of carefree cooking. And they say two scoops rice, one scoop mac salad always accompanies the traditional plate lunch. And the rice, this is really important because it has to do with contrast. I'm going to touch on this in a minute. The rice is such an important part of this meal because it provides the backdrop, right? It's, it's the bland canvas for all the other distinctive flavors of the main courses which often tend to the savory and the spicy. So the rice kind of cools it down, and the mac salad also kind of represents a counterpoint to the main courses while providing a, a small portion of vegetables also. Sometimes you get finely chopped carrots, little small diced celery, you know, just however the locals might like it. But the food in Hawaii, it reflects the contributions of all these cultures that, that came here to paradise each with unique ingredients, each with unique cooking methods, and each brought here for a different reason. So, you know, you get this combination of, of chicken, pork, and beef on the same plate, right? Rice and mac salad, it's, it's a metaphor for, for the melting pot, for the culture of Hawaii, for all the tastes and backgrounds that you'll find on these islands and how they seem to mix perfectly together. I don't think there's a Hawaiian word <laughs> for carefree cooking, you know, and I don't even think they would call it that. But when I visited here for the first time in 2000, for the second time, <laughs> for the third time, fourth time, fifth time, sixth time, this is the seventh time visiting the islands. Every time I come here, I learn something new. Hawaiian food is always changing. It's always taking new styles from other cultures. It's it's what others might call fusion, right, or Asian fusion, or, or maybe it's just throwing stuff together, but I call it carefree cooking, because here it is. Here's the big secret 
And the thing that I found out by interviewing a whole bunch of Hawaiian food artisans at the Maui Cattle Company, speaking with my buddy Tweedy there, I talked to him at length about how they raise beef and how they treat the cows. I was at the surfing goat farm in Maui, uh, got a lesson on making cheese. I've been to the farmer's markets here. Oh, what is that thing I'm holding? Hmm, do you know? Been to the markets, been to the fish markets. My favorite rum distillery is here. They get all their sugar cane from a 15-mile radius. Uh, they have a huge ti- Chinatown in Oahu. There are tropical fruit plantations. I mean, just the amount of food here to experiment with is really impressive. But I'll tell you, one of the most impressive food people I've ever met is here as well. Master Daniel Anthony is a master poi maker. Now, if you don't know what poi is, it's the national dish of Hawaii. Not, not national, but <laughs> cultural dish of Hawaii. I, I best describe it to the une, uninitiated as sticky purple mashed potatoes, but <laughs> Master Daniel would kill me for saying, that, for saying that. It's so much more than that. But think of purple mashed potatoes. They're really sticky. And this stuff is pounded with an ancient rock. And what it does is change the entire chemical structure and texture of the poi. Again, it's, it's a tuber, like a purple potato. Master Daniel makes it look really easy. It makes it look like you're just smashing up a potato with a rock. But when I sat down next to him, Trust me, it is not easy at all. There's an art to all this stuff, and that's where my respect for this culture comes from. From the North Shore, uh, the food tours that they do there, to the luau's on the South Shore, I have seen it, I have eaten it, I have cooked it here in Hawaii. And, you know, the, the big secret here, the, the thing that I have gleaned from all these years of coming to the originating place of carefree cooking is that while all these cuisines are so dissimilar and all these cultures are so different, I did discover that they have one thing in common, and that's the fact that they all cook with a concentration on manipulating the four senses on the palate. And this is where the French chef will tell you, you know, about where his food from comes from. Oh, monsieur, we buy only the best ingredients. That's what the French would brag about. The German chef would probably tell you about the history of the dish, the long-standing nature of it. The Spanish chef is going to tell you exactly how to make paella in his specific way without deviating from the process. But it's the Hawaiian chef that is the first to ask how the ingredient is going to interact with the other ingredients in his creation. How will salty go together with bitter? How is sweet and sour going to pair, right? The Hawaiian chef is the one thinking about your tongue more than any other cuisine. And that's why I keep coming back here, because I learn every time I cook. Where have I heard that before, right? Continually learning. Because for someone like me that cannot get enough when it comes to new food combinations and new food ideas, this is like returning to my mentor, you know, that coming here is, is like finding my, my wise man, my guru, my kahuna, right? My, my spiritual guide when it comes to food and cooking. And if you'd like to know more about this concept of, of cooking for the four senses on the palate, I'm starting a brand new free online class this week that I'm going to tell you about in just a minute. But I do want to check in with our Carefree Cooks community first because it's time for the dish of the week. And Sam must have heard uh, what the topic was going to be this week, because he he described it this way, a braised chicken breast swimming in a ginger uh, coconut lime sauce bath, (laughs) sauce bath with corn and asparagus, guarded by a pillar of cilantro infused and studded with heirloom grape tomatoes. (laughs) The description makes it sound delicious, and uh, as Sam says that it was delicious as well. Thanks, Sam. Great fusion going on there. Uh, John did some fusion of his own. He made a pastrami Reuben strudel. I'll let that sink in for a minute. Pastrami Reuben strudel. Nice job, John. Uh, John is one, oh, another John is a, a brand new carefree cook. He is a new member that just joined us this week, and he has already got the idea about carefree cooking because he made this spanakopita, 
Uh, somebody took a bite out of it, I guess. I guess. He made the spanakopita, but he had the, some leftover spinach filling for the spanakopita, so he made spanakopita breakfast wrap. Brilliant, right? That's carefree cooking right there. Welcome. Nice invention, John. I love it. First week, he's got dish of the week. And Paul, Paul puts apple slices in his grilled cheese sandwich. It doesn't have to be fancy, right? And you can't tell Paul that it's wrong to put apple slices on your, on your grilled cheese sandwich because it's good to him. And he's a carefree cook. And that's really all that matters. If it's good to you, then it's good. So I got to go make a, a grilled cheese sandwich with apples in a few minutes right now. I'm ready to do it. But there is the what am I. Uh, this thing that I'm holding here, it's called carambola. Uh, you might know it as star fruit. A lot of people here in Hawaii have them in their backyards. <laughs> they are everywhere. You go to the farmer's markets, there's bushels and bushels of them. Uh, it's called carambola uh, or star fruit. Oh, and this brand new class that I mentioned that I was talking about, oh, before, <laughs> uh, please like or share this video. Send it to your friends. Tell them about it, how they can really get to the essence of carefree cooking and where it started. And I did want to tell you about this brand new class I mentioned earlier. It's called Five Steps to Choosing the Perfect Combination of Flavors in Your Cooking. And you'll have an entirely new focus and a new target for your cooking when you start to think about the complementary or contrasting flavors in everything that you create. So go to webcookingclasses.com slash, uh, I think slash, yeah, that way, slash webcookingclasses.com slash flavor, F-L-A-V-O-R, webcookingclasses.com slash flavor to hold your spot in the next class. Uh, this is Chef Todd Moore uh, saying aloha, hang loose, everyone, and reminding you that there's a method to your really inspired carefree cooking success. Uh, we'll see you next Tuesday. Bye, everyone.